now to get to the, uh, to the event that you are all here for, uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce to you all Dr. John Pitt. Uh, Dr. Pitt is Assistant Professor of Japanese Environmental Humanities in the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he holds a PhD in Japanese from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Pitt's research examines the intersections of Japanese literature and media and the environmental sciences with the aim of bringing the study of Japan into the growing field of critical plant studies. Mobilizing his work is the question of how interdisciplinary work across the humanities and the social sciences can foster new interpretive modes for both fields. His current book project called Becoming Botanical, Rethinking the Human Through Plant Life, plant life in Modern Japan, argues that vegetation and the scientific study of plants offered a number of modern Japanese writers and filmmakers a model through which to rethink human subjectivity and develop notions of plasticity, that is to say beyond the confines of the human body, beyond the con conventional sense of perception and, and human temporality in response to turbulent historical events. Beyond his book project, he's also the translator of important Japanese pieces, including the work of contemporary poet and essayist Ito Hiromi, uh, her um, Living Trees and Dying Trees, as well as the forthcoming Tree Spirits and Grass Spirits. Um, there's a number of other forthcoming pieces of work that as we should be seeing out in the ether sometime soon about botan botanical witnesses of Hiroshima and Chernobyl, uh, the history, through history as told through atmosphere in the work of Kawase Naomi, and uh, a chapter on reading the environment in Ishimure Michiko's, uh, Ishimure Michiko, Hayashi Fumiko, and Osaki Midori uh, and so I'm super excited <laughs> for all of those pieces, uh, and I hope you are too. Um, and finally, Dr. John Pitt is also the host of an environmental humanities podcast called Nature Mono. Uh, so I would invite you all to please check it out at uh, naturemono.com. Uh, so with that, I'll say please join me in welcoming Dr. Pitt to the University of Michigan and welcoming him to the stage. Great, thank you so much. Does this, is this working okay? Wonderful. Um, I've never had to give a talk after a Benchy performance before. <laughs> uh, it was really amazing, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited for the event tonight, and I also encourage everyone to, to come along. It's, I've taught A Page of Madness before in the past, but I've never had the opportunity to see it on the big screen, let alone with a Benchy and, and live music accompaniment as well. So um, I hope my talk today can capture even just a fraction of the excitement <laughs> that we all just witnessed for the past uh, 10 minutes. Um, but I want to begin my talk um, by thanking everyone at the Center for Japanese Studies and Barbara Kinzer in particular for um, arranging my travel and accommodations. And of course to Dr. Alisa Paredes for her amazing work um, as well as for inviting me here today and such a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, it really is an honor to be here at the University of Michigan. This is my first time ever visiting Michigan. And I have to say, uh, I'm really enjoying the fall weather. <laughs> As someone who lives in Southern California, um, to be able to see the trees changing color is a really kind of emotional thing for me. So uh, I'm really happy to be here. All right, so um, my talk today is drawn from relatively new work um, that is related to, but somewhat separate from my book project. So as Elisa already, uh, mentioned, uh, this is the title of my book project, Becoming Botanical, Rethinking the Human Through Plant Life in Modern Japan. So in the book, uh, I discuss cases in which writers and filmmakers turn to the botanical realm in response to crisis. Right? They imagine what it could mean to be more like plants, resilient and adaptable, full of life on time scales very different from those of the human being. In the book, becoming botanical is by and large a kind of utopian gesture um, that is arrived at by means of scientific curiosity and or spiritual speculation. The story I'm going to tell today is also a kind of a tale of becoming botanical, right? At the heart of my talk is a story in which two young lovers jump into a lake and become marimo, those round balls of algae that uh, serve as the main protagonist of my talk today. But as I hope to show, this botanical becoming was actually the product of an imposition, a claim of imagined indigeneity that has led to decades of misattribution. But I also hope to show 
that becoming Marimo had its own utility for the indigenous Ainu community around Lake Akan, which is where our story begins. So Lake Akan is, uh, sits in the Kushiro region of Japan's northernmost island of Hokkaido, and it is home to world famous algae, which is always a strange thing to say, world famous algae. Those free, uh, free floating spherical shaped verdant growths of Gigagrapilia linnaei, which are known in Japanese as Marimo. Marimo have accomplished a really rare feat for an alga. They've become a charismatic species and are even sold as pets in Japan and abroad. A popular website promoting Japanese culture puts it this way, quote, if you're tired of fish but can't find another pet besides plants, which aren't pets, to take care of, why don't you try Marimo? In 2005, a Japanese souvenir company created Marimokori, which some of you may know, an anthropomorphized Marimo intended to promote tourism to Hokkaido. And there's lots to say about this character, <laughs> um, which I won't really get into uh, in the talk today, but um, if anybody has questions about him in the Q&A, we can certainly uh, talk about this guy. So in contrast to this, let's say, playful uh, marketing of Marimo, the Alga's deeper history is thoroughly entangled within Japan's settler colonial history on the island of Hokkaido. Central to Japan's so-called development of Hokkaido, which officially became a part of Japan in 1869, was its forced assimilation and cultural erasure of the island's indigenous Ainu population. Settler colonial efforts to which the Lake Akan-based Marimo Festival responds by promoting Ainu culture. This annual festival promotes Ainu dance performances, sorry, features Ainu dance performances and culminates in an Iomante sending off ceremony, which a group of men row a hand carved canoe out onto Lake Akan and return Marimo to its waters. The dual nature of this festival can be glimpsed in this latter ceremony, as it is intended to address both the suppression of Ainu culture and the endangered status of the Marimo. One of the stated objectives of the festival is, quote, promoting igagrapilias uh, from poaching and the lowering of the water level due to hydroelectric power generation, end quote. So visitors to Lake Akan are generally led to believe that there is a very long history of Ainu cultural affinity for the Marimo, as the festival would suggest. Tourists are regularly greeted with a famous story which is long purported to be uh, an Ainu folk tale, one in which two young star-crossed lovers named Mani Pe and Setona jump into the lake and become a single Marimo through death. Conventionally called the legend of Marimo love, Koi Marimo Densetsu, the story is well known throughout Japan and has taken form in numerous versions told across a wide variety of media. But the legend of Marimo love is not a true Ainu folk tale. It is, to borrow a term from Richard M. Dorson, fake lore, uh, which is a term for a tale falsely ascribed to a, fake, a folkloric tradition, in this case, one having been written by a non-Ainu Japanese author. And while it, it draws from Ainu ceremonial practices, the Marimo festival itself is not historically a traditional ceremony, having been created in 1950 by both Ainu and non-Ainu parties. And yet, Members of the Ainu community around Lake Akan, which is home to the Akanko Ainu Kotan settlement that serves as a tourist destination and site for Ainu cultural promotion, have embraced both the story and the festival for their role in promoting tourism to the region. So my talk today looks to map how Marimo became a charismatic symbol of imagined indigeneity, beginning around Lake Akan and spreading throughout Japan and ultimately the world at large. It considers what it means for the alga to have been embraced by the Lake Akan Ainu community in the name of preservation twice over, that of the imagined, or sorry, that of the endangered alga and of Ainu identity itself. So Marimo, the name, uh, this is comprised of two words in Japanese, Mari, right, which refers to a ball used for sports or play, and Mo, which refers to aquatic plants like seaweed or algae. And so once again, we have a, a kind of playful name here, something playfully evocative, but the name itself nevertheless bears the legacy of Japanese settler colonialism. Igagrapilla Linnaei was given the name Marimo by Kawakami Takia, whose mention of the alga in 1898 in the Journal of Japanese Botany 
has been referred to as its so-called discovery in Japan. And of course, this is a claim that effectively erases Ainu presence from the Lake Akan landscape. Ainu ancestral lands once stretched from the northern end of Japan's main island of Honshu, up through Hokkaido, out across the Kuril Islands, and southern Sakhalin Island as well. By the turn of the 20th century, however, the Ainu were conventionally believed to be a so-called dying race and were effectively written out of Japanese history by the passage of the 1899 Hokkaido Former Natives Protection Act. It would take until the year 2008 for the Japanese government to officially recognize the Ainu as indigenous to northern Japan. So when Kawakami first wrote of Marimo, he was a student at Sapporo Agricultural College, uh, which was originally founded in 1872 in Tokyo as the Kaitakushi Tentative School, with Kaitakushi being the name of the governmental agency uh, that was tasked with the development of Hokkaido. And the school's purpose was to educate students to this end. Kawakami was tasked by the local government in Hokkaido to survey both the weather and the flora of the Lake Akan region. Such surveys were indispensable to a fledgling colonial government looking to transform the island of Hokkaido into the agricultural center that it has become today. But Kawakami's connection to Marimo ties the alga even further into Japan's colonial history, beyond the borders of Hokkaido through imperial botany. Kawakami went on to name and document botanical species in Japanese-occupied Taiwan, where he had helped establish the National Taiwan Museum and served as its inaugural director. In 1915, Kawakami published a travelogue slash botanical field guide based on his trips throughout the South Pacific, titled In the Shade of Palm Trees. Yashi no Hakage. <laughs> Elisa is, is, is picking up uh, uh, the, um, the name of this is uh, the name of a, a recent book that has a very different spin on it. So anyway, in his preface to this work, uh, Kawakami writes that his botanical research is an important contribution to Japan's imperial expansion. He writes this, quote, in my estimation, the South Pacific is a place we Japanese must certainly develop in the future, and we must exhaustively survey it from every aspect. Right now, it is of the utmost importance that we provide full knowledge of the true state of affairs to our nation. One can imagine that Kawakami felt similarly about the work or his work cataloging the plant life around Lake Akan, including Marimo. A little over 20 years after Kawakami first published on Marimo, the Japanese government officially recognized the alga as worthy of conservation. Following the 1919 passing of the historic sites, scenic beauty and natural monuments preservation law, the government declared Lake Akan Marimo a natural monument in 1921. One of the key factors that led to this declaration was the uniqueness of the freshwater alga's biology. Of particular note was Marimo's uh, characteristic spherical shape and limited distribution. For while Igagrophila linnaei can be found growing attached to rocks and as unattached filaments, the environment of Lake Akan uh, resulted uh, in unusually large ball-shaped Marimo. And to this day, the uh, record on the largest Marimo is 34 centimeters in diameter. So another key factor leading to its designation as a natural monument was the growing concern that human actions such as poaching for souvenir use uh, could have adverse effects on the lake's ecosystem, leading to the loss of this unique species. And indeed, such fears were justified. Around the time of Marimo's designation as natural monument, a hydroelectric plant was established on the banks of the Akan River. As water was used, sorry, there we go. Uh, as water was used for electricity production, uh, the water level of Lake Akan was lowered in areas in which Marimo had previously accumulated. This led to Marimo being exposed to the open air, causing many to dry out and die. In response to the increased energy demand occasioned by Japan's post-war recovery effort, Lake Akan's situation continued to worsen after the end of World War II. In the spring of 1950, uh, the water level in the lake dropped below 60 centimeters in some areas, exposing and killing many Marimo. This incident, which entered public discourse as the electricity or Marimo debate, served as the impetus for upgrading the status of Lake Akan's Marimo to special natural monument in 1952. So this electricity or Marimo debate also served as the background from which the Marimo Festival was created in 1950, the organizing guidelines of which highlighted its intention to promote 
conservation. Yet, due to the continued harvesting of Marimo for souvenir use and the further polluting of Lake Akan, the Marimo population continued to decline after the 1950s, and by 1997, um, they were deemed critically endangered, and they continue to hold that status to this day. So one year after the Lake Akan Marimo were given the status of natural monument, an unknown non-Ainu Japanese writer named Nagata Kosaku published the story that would later become the legend of Marimo love. The fake lore that would end up causing many to believe that there was a strong connection between the Marimo and traditional Ainu culture. Nagata's story, the sad sound of the reed flute on the wind blowing down from Mount Akan, first appeared in the collection Mountain Legends and Love Stories, which was published by the Osaka office of the Asahi Shimbun newspaper. Now the book's introduction lauds the expansive collection of stories contained within, which include, quote, mysterious ones, ones that are dramatizations of historical fact, and ones passed down by way of oral tradition, end quote. Now the preface does not specify which stories belong to which category, but the sad sound of the reed flute opens on the figure of an elderly Ainu who proceeds to tell the rest of the narrative. narrative introducing it as, quote, something that happened 500 years ago, end quote. So this apparent oral folk tale tells the tragic story of two young Ainu, Setana and Mani Be. Later, as the story took on a life of its own and spread throughout popular media, his name would be changed to Mani Pe. In this case, it's still Mani Be. Setona is the daughter of the village chieftain. Mani Be is the son of a servant who works for Setona's family. As such, he is an inappropriate love match for her. To her dismay, Setana is instead promised to a vulgar man named Mekani. Near the end of the story, Mani Bey rescues Setana from Mekani's forceful advances, upon which she confesses her love for Mani Bey. Duty bound to his position as a servant to her father, Mani Bey tells Setana that they cannot be together. Setana never recovers from his refusal. She ends the story confined to bed, quote, crying as if she had lost her mind, end quote. Manibe, meanwhile, is confronted by a knife-wielding Mekani late one night. A scuffle ensues, and Manibe manages to get a hold of Mekani's knife. He stabs him, killing Mekani on the spot. In fear, Manibe approaches the shore of Lake Akan and begins rowing his canoe out onto the lake while blowing into his reed flute which the mechanics of which still sort of boggle my mind a little bit, but putting that aside. Um, Mani Bey hears the sound of the villagers rowing out after him, and the story concludes in this way. After that night, the figure of Mani Bey was never to be seen again. A few days later, Setana died while continuing to call out the name of her beloved. And so it is said that the two have become one within a single Marimo that lives in the depths of the lake, and that the sad sound of a reed flute Sorry, the sad sounds of a reed flute come blowing from Mount Akan down to the lake, mixed with the sound of a woman's crying. End quote. So it's here at the end that Marimo makes its only appearance in Nagata's story. Like the legend it would go on to become, Nagata's story finds its two Ainu protagonists becoming a single Marimo after dying tragic deaths. But whereas the legend of Marimo love conventionally ends with Mani Pe, and Setana jumping into Lake Akan in an act of lover suicide, Nagata's source material does not. Thus, part of the story's metamorphosis into the legend of Marimo love is its changed ending, in addition, of course, to its false attribution as an Ainu folktale. So how then did Nagata's story become what it became? A tale of a lover suicide falsely ascribed to the tradition of Ainu mythology. This question weighed heavily on the mind of Wakana Isamu, the head research at the Kushiro International Wetland Center, and one of the world's foremost Marimo experts, if not the world's most foremost Marimo expert. It was Wakana, who is known by his nickname, Dr. Marimo, he's great, uh, who first published on this connection between the legend of Marimo love and Nagata's forgotten source material. In a series of columns written for the Kushiro Shinbun newspaper between June 2018 and March uh, 2019, and then later collected on his website, 
Wakana explains that over 30 some odd years um, that he has spent researching Marimo, he has come across several texts that have convinced him that the legend of Marimo love was not an Ainu story, but rather the creation of a Japanese writer or a wajin, which is the term often used to distinguish non uh, Ainu Japanese from Ainu. While Wakana was the first to publish about Nagata's story, being the source material for the legend of Marimo love, he was not the first to doubt its authenticity. Wakana mentions a specific essay by one Sato Notaro, which was titled On Marimo, Marimo Nitsite, which was included in a um, 1961 three volume collection that chronicled Sato's uh, research on his native Kushiro region. In this essay, Sato claims that the legend of Marimo love is not an authentic Ainu folktale and that it began as a story included in the 1926 volume, Ainu Folklore and Love Stories. Um, it would be republished just as Ainu Folklore a few years later. And this is a book um, that was compiled by Aoki Jinji. So the story that Sato mentions, uh, which is titled The Sad Sound of a Reed Flute, is nearly identical to Nagata's version, but with a, key, uh, sorry, with a few key differences. The most obvious difference is that the, this 1926 version is not ascribed to any particular author, even though it is clearly based on Nagata's story. It also cuts out the character of the Ainu storyteller from Nagata's original, and it renders Nagata's classically inflected literary prose into a more colloquial form of the Japanese language. These changes, bolstered by the fact that Nagata's name was not attached to the story, surely helped give it an aura of authenticity as Ainu folklore, as the book's title suggests, and its introduction outright claims when it says that, quote, the stories included here are ones that I searched for in old documents, read thoroughly in exhaustive research on folklore, and furthermore heard personally from the elderly inhabitants of Ainu villages, end quote. And yet, this 1926 version of the story ends with a note that reads, from Mountain Legends and Love Stories, the name of the 1922 book that featured Nagata's tale in the first place. So having seen this note, Wakana decided to track down a copy of Mountain Legends and Love Stories, and thereupon developed his own suspicions that it was in fact Nagata's version that was the true original. Then, out of the blue, in 2017, he received a letter from Nagata's son, Natsuo. The letter explained how Natsuo wanted to clear up the origins of the legend of Marimo love for posterity's sake. Natsuo writes that his father had spent some time working in Kushiro, and while there, he heard a story from an Ainu elder with whom he had become acquainted. The story concerned a pair of young lovers from rival Ainu settlements who eventually drowned themselves in a lover's suicide. It was this story that apparently served as Nagata's inspiration when he later wrote the sad sound of the reed flute on the wind blowing down from Mount Akan. However, Given the fact that Nagata's story does not actually end with a lover's suicide, one might wonder whether this anecdote is not a last minute attempt to recuperate some amount of authenticity by linking the fake lore to an Ainu source in some small way. In any case, it is clear that Marimo were added to the story at Nagata's discretion, likely owing to have it, its having been granted natural monument status the previous year. So in the shift from Nagata's version to Aoki's modification of the story, the tale became its process of becoming Ainu. And this is a term that I use in reference to a critical intervention into global indigenous studies laid out by Annalise Llewellyn in her amazing monograph, The Fabric of Indigeneity, Ainu Identity, Gender, and Settler Colonialism in Japan. In her study, Llewellyn calls the self-fashioning of identity that she examines in relation to cloth work becoming Ainu and argues that the term marks an important break from a biological view of indigeneity that, quote, shifts the focus from a predetermined innate Ainuness to an Ainuness selectively forged by each individual, thereby displacing the centrality of blood in regulating ethnicity and recentering individual agency and the process of self-determination, end quote. So the transformation that begins with Aoki's version of the story and ends with the conventional assumption that the legend of Marimo love is an Ainu folktale, um, did not come through 
a process of self-determination, right? But rather, it was a long process of interpolation, understood here as a tool of assimilation, in which Wajin, non-Ainu Japanese actors, crafted an imagined indigenous cosmology from the outside and imposed a cultural significance on the tale and consequently the Marimo itself that had no historical basis. Marimo's becoming Ainu was thus initially a matter of being made Ainu. As a rare species that aroused public imagination, Marimo served as a kind of botanical terra nullius, what we might call a planta nullius, that was ripe for such inscription within a settler colonial system. Hokkaido had been deemed a uh, terra nullius of its own, portrayed as a vast empty frontier that in Michelle Mason's words, quote, served the state's goals by acting as a foil to confirm Japan's superior status and rationalize the colonial project, wherein its configuration as a purely natural space, devoid of human habitation, history, and culture, end quote, not only rendered its indigenous habits, uh, inhabitants an ahistorical blank slate, but also found newly discovered species like Marimo free of any pre-existing cultural connotations. Right. Trees, flowers, grasses, these all had centuries of well-worn cultural associations in Japan. But Marimo had no such deep right, aesthetic history. This made it easy for someone like Nagata or Aoki to dream up fake lore that linked the alga to Ainu culture. As a plantanulius, Marimo could be made Ainu from the outside, its aesthetic otherness bolstered by its new association with the colonial other of the Ainu. And it was on this botanical blank slate that the legend of Marimo love was inscribed as fake lore over and over again. For Nagata's short story, metamorphosized in the years following its publication in 1922, by 1931, it had taken on enough of a life of its own that the Kushido Shinbun um, newspaper ran an article promoting an upcoming radio broadcast devoted to local Ainu folklore that included a tale in which two Ainu lovers jump into the lake and become a single Marimo through death, which again was not the original version and ending of the story. But this version of the tale gained traction in the Lake Akan region as a means to promote tourism especially after the establishment of the Marimo Festival in 1950. And this all led to, this, to a song, um, which was inspired by the story to become a nationwide hit in 1953. That is Song of the Marimo, Marimo no Uta, written by lyricist Iwase Hiroshi and composer uh, Yashima Hideaki. Uh, and this was uh, famously performed by the popular singer Ando Mariko, who was born near Lake Akan in Kitami. Um, the song has been covered numerous times, and like the legend of Marimo Love, it can often be heard in tourist establishments around the lake. The song is three verses. The first mentions Lake Akan by name and speaks of the, quote, lonely wind that crosses the surface of the water, end quote. It addresses the floating Marimo directly, asking them what they are thinking. The second verse continues like this. Floating to the water's surface when clear, Sinking to the water's depth when cloudy, love becomes one with sorrow. O oh, Marimo, O oh, Marimo, tearful Marimo. Biologist Sakai Yoshio begins his 1991 book, The Science of Marimo, by disputing this verse's claim that Lake Ma uh, Akan's Marimo float and sink depending on the weather. To be sure, he writes, quote, Marimo in a laboratory aquarium with good light will float and sink, but in Lake Akan, they don't move the way the song claims." So clearly, uh, the song of the Marimo was still popular enough some four decades after it was released that Sakai felt the need to dispel the misinformation it promoted in his scientific book. But what Sakai does not feel the need to address is the song's invocation of the legend of Marimo love. For what is hinted at in the second verse, right, love becomes one with sorrow, uh, is made explicit in the third verse, which goes like this. Even now in the Ainu village of a lasting romance, it sings sorrowfully. Marimo, the shadow it casts is lonely. Oh, Marimo, oh, Marimo, green Marimo. So while it does not mention Manipe or Manibe and Setona by name, the song references their doomed romance all the same. 
It would seem that by 1953, the fake lore was known well enough that it could be referenced in such an indirect way and still connect with a national audience that understood the referent. Today, a large stone memorial bearing the song's lyrics sit on the shore of Lake Akan. The story it tells, a secondhand product of imagined indigeneity, stands literally engraved into the landscape. And this landscape would go on to serve as the setting for an international collaboration between a Japanese composer and a Russian ballet dancer during the height of the Cold War that once again suggested the legend of Marimo love was an Ainu tale. In 1962, composer Ishii Khan deb debuted his ballet Marimo in Tokyo. Four years earlier, he had won a prize for his uh, composition titled Symphonia Ainu. So Ishii was invited to compose the music for Marimo by the Tchaikovsky Commemorative Ballet School of Japan, which also invited A. A. Warlermov from the Bolshoi Ballet School in Russia to help develop the production. So according to the liner notes included in the soundtrack album for, Ma for Marimo, which we see here, Warlermov, quote, became very interested in the legend about the Marimo and thus, quote, carried out research on the customs of the Ainu, end quote. Warlermov reportedly visited the Ainu community at Lake Akan and uh, made recordings of Ainu music and eight millimeter videos of Ainu dance. He also consulted with Japanese artists and intellectuals in order to avoid having his ballet turn into, quote, an inappropriate work made by a foreigner, end quote. The fact that the legend of Marimo love was fake lore seems not to have been communicated to Warlermov. And so Manipe and Setona become the focus of the ballet he helped author, even as he reportedly strove for authenticity. The story once again took on a new iteration. In the ballet, Setona is no longer the village chief's daughter. In this version, she is poor and meets Manipe as he saves her from a bear attack. The two fall in love, but it is a Manipe who ends up being forced to marry another. In order to nullify Manipe's uh, engagement to this other woman, Setana must face a series of challenges to appease the gods of Lake Akan. She has her eyes plucked out. She loses her ability to hear and speak. Manipe nevertheless recognizes Setana um, when she arrives at his wedding ceremony. The two leave the ceremony together and Manipe then faces three challenges of his own. He is attacked by a murder of crows, forced to struggle against a massive windstorm, and is told that he must leave his life behind and jump into the lake, where he will then find his beloved. Having completed these tasks, the two become Marimo and dance a pas de deux of love. So through song and dance, the fake lore that is the legend of Marimo love took on new forms and found new life as inspiration for variations on a theme that was still believed by many to be an Ainu folktale. But not everyone believed the story's supposed provenance. It was Sato no Taro's essay that convinced Wakana Isamu that the legend of Marimo love was not a true Ainu folktale, but Sato was not alone in doubting its origins. Poet, farmer, and anarchist Sadashina Genzo, for example, raised doubts about the authenticity of the legend of Marimo love in the first volume of his three volume account of Ainu ecology titled A Kotan Wildlife, uh, which was originally published in 1942 and then revised and republished in 1976. Sadashina, uh, who was born in Hokkaido to first generation Wajin settlers and both collected Ainu folklore and wrote about Ainu life in his poetry, devotes a section of his first volume of A Kotan Wildlife to Marimo. He begins the section with a direct reference to the legend of Marimo love, claiming that Marimo is, quote, the main character of the story, which you are bound to hear somewhere if you visit Lake Hakan. But, Sadashina points out, as beautiful as the story is, it is not to be found in any of the Ainu tales handed down from antiquity. Sadashina writes that there is, however, a tale known among the elderly Ainu around Lake Hakan concerning Marimo, but it is radically different in tone from the legend of Marimo love. He recounts it as follows. It's a little bit long here. Long ago, for some reason, the god of Lake Akan disliked water chestnuts, Pekampe in Ainu. Yet somehow or other, some water chestnuts found their way into the lake. In hoping for company, they asked the god to help them multiply. The god replied coldly, just by being there, 
um, you dirty up the lake. And if your numbers were to grow, humans would come to collect you and further muck up this beautiful lake. By no means can I allow you to be here. This angered the water chestnuts and they plucked up the grass along the lake shore and all the water plants and threw them at the god of the lake. Then they left. The grass and water plants become, became entangled in refuse, thus forming Marimo. And so the Ainu word for Marimo is Tokarip, which means that which lies in the lake, end quote. Sadashina notes that this folktale is in no way a love story and explains that Ainu feelings toward Marimo were less than favorable. He recounts that he was taught by Ainu elders that as Marimo numbers increase, it becomes difficult to catch fish. He lists a few other Ainu words for Marimo that express the dislike for the alga. Tora, uh, torasampe, or lake goblin, or tosuru, tosuruku, uh, lake poison. Sarashina concludes that, quote, if there is a story claiming to be an Ainu folktale that has a beautiful love story written into it, we can be sure without a doubt that it is a fictional tale created by a wajin, end quote. The fact that his Khotan wildlife would gain mainstream popularity some 70 years later due to its association with the massively popular and quite controversial manga Golden Kamui um, would likely have amused Sadashina. The story, which is set in Hokkaido around the turn of the 20th century, br briefly features a scene uh, in which a child moves to Lake Akan and is bullied into eating Marimo. It's a scene befitting the description of Marimo as Lake Goblin. Yet, even before Sadashina attempted to set the record straight, Yamamoto Tatsuke, who would become a major figure in the Ainu independence movement after the war, and the driving force behind the creation of the Marimo Festival in 1950, was writing of the inauthenticity of the legend of Marimo love. In 1940, Yamamoto published his own collection of Ainu folk tales, which was titled Akan National Park and Ainu Folklore. And he included a version of the legend of Marimo love that he called the tale of Setona and the Marimo. Yamamoto summarizes the story and follows the conventional telling of it, including the lover's suicide at the end. But his framing of the story casts doubts on its origin. Marimo suggests the story is in fact fake lore, writing, in order to write this book, I conducted research for three years in the Lake Akan area, but none of the Lake Akan Ainu knew this famous legend. So, given that Yamamoto knew that the legend of Marimo love was not a story told among the Ainu community at Lake Akan, his decision to include it in his collection can be seen as a first step towards reclaiming the fake lore. His inclusion of the story was an effort to become Ainu within Llewellyn's parameters of the term, in which, quote, self-craft describes a process of forging an Ainu identity firmly rooted in ancestral values, worldview, and life ways but one that is sufficiently flexible to adapt these values to, the, uh, to meet the needs of the present." End quote. Yamamoto seemed to understand that Marimo was a plantanulius and decided to begin an inscription of his own. He saw the potential to reclaim the supposed ainu myths of Marimo perpetuated by the legend of Marimo love and use the algas imagined indigeneity to self-craft a new tradition 10 years later in the form of the Marimo festival a tradition that better reflected Ainu ancestral values, worldview, and life ways than the fake lore originally did. A brochure for the Akanko Ainu Kotan that promotes the festival elaborates on these values and life ways in this way. The Ainu people are an indigenous people to Hokkaido where they lived for countless generations before the arrival of the Sisan Japanese. Their ancestors referred to Hokkaido as Ainu Moshi tranquil land of the people and believed spirits or kamui inhabited the natural world. They humbly paid homage, homage to these kamui and lived in thanks uh, of the bounty of nature. Under the spirit of coexistence symbolized by the saying, I am where the kamui are and the kamui are where I am, the Ainu people have lived in harmony with their surroundings without modifying, destroying, or polluting the natural environment." End quote. So created to help preserve both Ainu cultural heritage and the endangered alga itself, the Marimo Festival thus enacts a form of traditional ecological knowledge in which the sacrality of the natural world informs ecological conservation. As a first step towards self-fashioning a cultural relationship to Marimo that would ultimately result in the creation of the Marimo Festival, 
Yamamoto's Akan National Park and Ainu folklore ultimately becomes a site of resistance within a settler colonial logic that looked to define what is and what is not authentic the Ainu tradition. Now at the same time, the Marimo Festival has held and continues to hold the contested ambiguous status uh, among Ainu communities. As Tessamora Suzuki reminds us, quote, the preservation and presentation of culture has been a deeply contested, divisive, and problematic issue for Ainu society, end quote. And the Marimo Festival is no exception. In director Fukunaga's, uh, sorry, Fukunaga's, uh, Fukunaga Takeshi's two th uh, 2020 film, Ainu Moshiri, uh, which is a story about the Ainu community around Lake Akan that features actors um, from the community, the Marimo Festival is presented as primarily public facing and is contrasted with a more private, controversial, bare sending off ceremony, um, one that is you know, portrayed as more authentic. Indeed, since its inception, the Marimo Festival has been criticized for exploiting Ainu culture for the sake of tourism. In the face of this criticism, Yamamoto has defended the creation of the event as, quote, a means to regain our pride. The Akanko Ainu Kotan continues to defend the festival as a way to offer devout prayer to the Kamui through the Marimo, and thus turn Lake Akan into, quote, a focal point for the Ainu people to pass down their spiritual heritage to future generations, end quote. So Yamamoto recognized the flexibility that the ambiguous status of the Marimo afforded him in regards to notions of authenticity. He used this ambiguity to reawaken an Ainu culture he felt had faded in the wake of World War II, claiming that, quote, when the Ainu came together, or sorry, came to gather for the Marimo Festival, I saw a forgotten people become excited. It was planned as a cultural exchange, and as a result, in each region, the practice of Ainu dances began again. Each year, the Ainu came together, and the level of the arts continued to improve, and their spirits changed, end quote. Annalise Llewellyn notes that tourism has been a double-edged sword for the Ainu communities, as it has, quote, packaged Ainu cultural knowledge and difference for mass consumption, while also, quote, serving as an incubator to maintain this knowledge and link culture once again with economic livelihood, end quote. Yet she also stresses that tourist communities like the one around Akanko Lake Akan, uh, sorry, Akanko Ainu Kotan, um, have enabled the preservation of Ainu Furi, which is the proper comportment based on ancestral protocols, as well as the conservation of natural resources necessary to sustain it. So Yamamoto's reclamation of the legend of Marimo love and his subsequent help in creating the Marimo festival can thus be read as an act of becoming Ainu through an agential self-inscription onto the plantanulius that is the Marimo. And now that it has been firmly established uh, in the media that the legend of Marimo love is fake lore, members of the Akanko Ainu Kotan appear willing to let the story continue to cir circulate in order to draw more visitors to the lake. A 2017 newspaper article, which was titled, um, The Legend of Marimo Love was the creation of an ethnic Japanese wajin, closes with the words of Nishida Masao, uh, the head of the Ainu Craft Collective at the Akanko Ainu Kotan. Um, he can also be seen participating in the Marimo Festival in Fukunaga's film. He uh, says this, quote, the story's plot is interesting and it encourages tourism to Lake Akan. It's fine to continue introducing this story to the people from here on out, as long as we make it clear that it's not an Ainu legend. So in March of 2021, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued an alert to anyone who had purchased, quote, a moss ball aquatic plant project product after February 1st of the same year, asking them to destroy, don't dump their marimo. The charismatic pet algae, it was discovered, had been quietly smuggling in an invasive species into the United States, the zebra mussel. The alert calls the zebra mussel, quote, one of the most destructive invasive species in North America as it can quickly take over once they get established in a water body and cause significant damage, end quote. So to ward off this threat of invasion, the Fish and Wildlife Service mandated Marimo must be destroyed through freezing, boiling, or bleaching, and then be disposed of in sealed plastic bags. 
Now, given Marimo's place within the settler colonial history of Hokkaido, the concerns over its invasive potential and the systematic plan to eradicate its existence in, the in North America take on something of an uncanny hue. Once again, Marimo finds itself being used by invasive actors, its charismatic charm hiding the threat of uncontrolled expansion hidden within its green body. The invasive Marimo in question, however, did not come from Lake Akan, but rather were imported into California from Ukraine. Chain retailers such as Petco pulled these lake goblins off their shelves, although one could still purchase them from online retailers that continued to mistakenly promote the legend of Marimo love as an authentic Ainu folktale. And recently, Marimo have begun appearing uh, once again on pet shop shelves across the US. So it is tempting to see this zebra muscle infested chapter of Marimo history as something of a conclusion to the long tale of becoming Marimo that began with Nagata Kosaku's decision to write fake lore in 1922. As he wrote of an imaginary indigenous cosmology in which Ainu lovers became forever united within a single Marimo, Nagata set off a chain of events that would distance the Marimo further and further from Ainu traditional ecological knowledge. As the legend of Marimo love helped fuel the commodification of the Marimo, the alga eventually entered into an e economic network of international distribution that would take it from Ukrainian lakes to the United States, where it would come to threaten the very waterways that would serve as its new expanded ecosystem. And thus, while consumers who had been lured in potentially by the romantic tale of Manipe and Setuna had to freeze, boil, and or bleach their Marimo in preparation for the unbecoming that is disposal, the community around Lake Akan prepared for another year of the perpetual becoming that is the Marimo Festival, where they sing and dance and return Marimo to the watery depths of the lake from whence they came. In the process, their actions echo the words of Norway-based Ainu artist and founder of the Ainu Today project, Uzawa Kanako, who writes, um, who describes her contemporary take on traditional Ainu dance as a new way to emphasize the continuously developing nature of culture. And so I end with Uzawa's words when she says, I am, as I am, a, uh, as I am of a generation that is the result of strong assimilation, I feel I have lost many aspects of traditional culture, but I refuse to accept that I am not in touch with my culture when I choose to author it in my own way. With that, I thank you all very much, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. John Pitt, for that really deeply intriguing talk. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome anyone with questions to ask them, please. We'll be entertaining questions from the Zoom and also live. Uh, and so if you have any questions and you're in the room with us now, please raise your hand and Yuri will hand the mic over to you. Uh, there's already a question uh, online, so I could always start with that. So I think I'll do that. Um, okay, so this is a, this is a question from I.K. Rotz uh, from the University of Oslo. I.K., I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your, your name. Um, but here, here it goes. Thank you, John, for this fascinating lecture. I visited Lake Akan and the Marimo myself recently and very much appreciated this historical background information. I do have a question about your use of terms like fake lore and imagined indigeneity. You are right, of course, that the Marimo Festival and the love story are 20th century inventions. But doesn't that apply to most, if not all, folk traditions? Aren't all traditions invented? This applies to most supposedly ancient Shinto, ri Shinto rituals in mainland Japan as well. Much of it is Meiji period invention. With indigenous communities like the Ainu, the process of reinvention is even more crucial because so much of their culture was destroyed in modernity. So of course Ainu rituals and festivals today are recent reinventions. Doesn't the, the term fake lore suggest an artificial distinction between quote, real, uh, authentic folklore and quote, quote, fake inventions, thus discrediting ongoing attempts at cultural survival and revitalization? Uh, thank you, yeah, thank you, Ike. Um, thanks for listening to the lecture. Yeah, um, very important question. And 
Uh, you're you're absolutely correct, right? Um, when it comes to things like like you know Shinto tradition um, and the like, my use of fake lore and this idea of imagined indi indigeneity um, is really an effort to address the uh, not so much the um, the side of it that I think you're focusing on, Ike, which is where I ultimately want to arrive in this talk, mm -hmm. right? Which is the the reclamation of it, right? It's really to point at, at how it starts, right? Um, the kind of freedom with which uh, this non Ainu writer felt, you know, uh, justified in, in in writing from an Ainu perspective, and whether or not he intended for it to kind of take on the life that it did, right? That um, approaching, uh, you know, and in, in inventing an Ainu cosmology from the outside, right? So that's where the kind of imaginary part comes in. Um, you know, by by championing or trying to champion people like Yamamoto Tasuke and Uzawa Kanako, right? These people who are, uh, as you say, like really trying to uh, work with inventing new traditions, right? Um, that's really amazing work, right? That is, in Llewellyn's terms, you know, becoming Ainu, and that's a an intervention and a kind of theoretical approach that I really support here. So. The idea of fake lore and imagined indigeneity is where things sort of start for me here. Um, it's not the ultimate place where they end up, right? So this was sort of the initial uh, efforts made by people like Nagata Kosaku and Aoki Junji, right? That they sort of had this, mm, uh, they, they felt a sort of freedom to, to imagine an indigenous cosmology, right? Which then is, as you say, um, you know, very progressively sort of taken over and made into something much closer to traditional ecological knowledge of the Ainu. So, um, but I take your point, right? And uh, it's a good thing to think about those very terms and something to, to make a, maybe a little bit more clear as I continue to work on this project. So thank you, Ike. That's great, thank you so much. Great, yeah. Thank you so much, John. This is a super rich talk, and I, I learned a lot, and I and, uh, have lots more questions to ask maybe afterwards. But I, I was wondering a little bit about um, some of the things you were talking about in terms of, or suggesting maybe about, particularly with the last slide, about um, the ways in which this kind of self-authoring was playing out um, and how it could be kind of positive, particularly given the kind of long history of, of um, storytelling around this. Yeah. And I was just wondering about this in relation to things like processes of racialization specifically. Um, I think partially because I was thinking about um, in some ways like at what moment historically does it become preferable to mark oneself um, as more botanical as opposed to as a racialized being and mm -hmm. kind of what's going on there and and so I, I, I couldn't help but think about like some of the arguments that people like Tina Klein are making and, and Cold War Orientalism about mm -hmm. this kind of like the king and I moment and like the kind of it's a small world after all moment where where there's a kind of value, at least internationally, kind of post World War II, around kind of affirming the the kind of human rights and so forth. And I'm just also then wondering, like, who has access to that kind of discourse, mm -hmm. and what types of discourse then kind of come in when one does not necessarily have kind of pride of place within that context. And so, I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um, I think particularly as I'm I'm thinking also about like uh, Christina Sharp's work and in, in the wake and weathering and other types of resilience. Um, that are taken up in a kind of black feminist frame as opposed mm -hmm. to this version. And so just to kind of think through some of those those issues in terms of historicizing a bit more that kind of, that uh, maybe reluctance to, to use racialized discourse, partially because of the trauma that, 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 that colonialism has wrought. Sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, wonderful question. Thank you so much for, for all of that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think because we have this moment you know, relatively recently, with the with the final sort of recognition from the Japanese government, right, of the Ainu as indigenous, um, I do think there's, uh, yeah, perhaps more mm, scholars, right, that are are interested in thinking about questions of race in relation to this. Um, that said, you know, there are folks like Ishihara Mai, for example, right, who um, are writing these really wonderful. Um, autoethnographies uh, about, you know, the so-called silent Ainu, right? And, and this very inability to sort of speak of oneself and mark oneself uh, as Ainu within any kind of 
cultural or racial um, configuration, right? So it is a very kind of um, uh, specific context, I think, here that, um, again, I, I, I definitely need to give more thought to. Um, because even within the category, right, of, of Ainu, Ainu community in Hokkaido, I mean, it's, it's extremely regional, of course, right? And, uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that mm, Tatsumura Suzuki is pointing to, right, when she's talking about these, these contestations of, you know, the tourist Ainu, for example, right? I mean, these are very, very old sort of um, uh, critiques, right, that, that linger. Um, I, I don't know if that gets to your question enough or not, but. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk more about that. Yeah. Thank you. Can we invite another, um, anyone else to ask a question? I think maybe there was something. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I've really been looking forward to this for a while, so it was wonderful to um, finally have you join us today. Um, so one thing that I'm wondering about is um, uh, if you are able to speak to um, how uh, so many marimo have made it uh, overseas as pets, mm -hmm. um, and if you know anything about the moss ball pet production for um uh you know people in the u.s for example mm -hmm. um and also if you happen to know anything about um either now or in the past um the environmental impact at lake akan that that might have had yeah i mean certainly in the past right there was a, a kind of rich <laughs> culture of, of poaching, right, um, for tourist use, uh, which is part of the reason why uh, these conservation efforts were made and even back in the 20s, right, so, so making it a natural monument was, was partly in response to the, these, these poaching efforts. Um, so, I mean, today, if you're going to go to PetSmart or Petco, like, you're not finding Lake Akan Marimo, you know, there. Um, for the most part, these are, from what I understand, Ukraine has been kind of the sort of source, I think, for you know the, the mass importation of, of Marimo. Um, there is question as to whether or not these are naturally formed or not. Uh, most likely they are not, right? That these are kind of balled up, <laughs> if you will, uh, in you know factories and the like. So um, yeah, I, it's something I do want to do a little bit more research into is kind of, kind of see like, where all of these guys are coming from. Um, although, as you can imagine, a lot of the companies that are selling them try to sort of, you know, mystify this. And, and so the, the one um, company I showed here, um, these are, again, not coming from Lake Akan, but this is sort of their big promotional story that they put on their website, right? It's to sort of imply, right, that it is, uh, and also again, use the story of Setana, although they, they have her name wrong there. Um, but they curiously have Mani Bay instead of Mani Pei, so I don't, I don't quite know what's going on here. But yeah, um, does that help at all, or does that kind of get to what you were asking? Yeah, okay, yeah, great. I think there's another question. Hi, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, my question is, I guess, kind of two parts. Yeah. One is, you mentioned the 2020 film about the Marimo Festival. Yeah. So I was curious if there are other media representations that you've encountered because I'm a media studies oh. person. So I'm very yeah. much interested in that as well. But also, I'm going to bring up the our little friend that you introduced <laughs> us at the beginning, uh, Marimo yeah. Pori. Yeah. And I'm very curious how that character relates to these large, like these issues that you are talking about. Like, how is this sort of Yuru Kara, right, mascot, like sort of part of one sort of perpetuating these sort of colonial, right, like sort of issues that you're bringing up yeah. of, of erasure mm -hmm. and sort of glossing it over with like the cuteness or the weirdness, I guess, in, in terms of this character, but also then how does it help or uh, the, these other efforts by like local Ainu sort of activists and mm -hmm. historians? Yeah. Um, as far as other, thank you for the question. Um, as far as other media representations, 
I mean, that one's sort of the most recent. Um, there is a, a, a Takada Taijun novel, which is um, like Lake and Forest Festival, I think is, is what it's called. And so Takada Taijun, you know, a well-known writer, was actually um, one of the people that uh, Warlermov, the, the, the Russian um, ballet uh, uh, writer, consulted with, right? And so, so there is this novel, which was also turned into a film. Um, I haven't been able to track down a copy of it yet, but I suspect that um, it, it's definitely a story that at least part of it takes place around the lake and, and, and mentions the Koi Marimo Densetsu in it. So that would be one place um, to try to track down that film. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, the, that brief moment in Golden Kamui, um, there are some older, uh, like documentary, like science films um, that, again, I haven't quite been able to, to track down, but they, they're out there, yeah. Um, right, and then your second question was about Marimo Kori. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's interesting. Um, as far as how it sort of plays into this story, I mean, I, I sort of bring him up just because he, he is a popular figure and certainly someone that people think about when they think of, of Marimo, and a, a character that is used not only in Hokkaido, right, but, but throughout Japan. There's um, sort of iterations of him where he takes the form of the Nara Daibutsu, for example, right? Um, what I haven't seen so much of um, is the kind of Ainuization of Marimo Kori. That may exist, but it's not something that I've, I've come across yet, which, again, is, is kind of curious, right? Um, so, yeah, as much as it's, it's definitely being, you know, sort of used to promote tourism to Hokkaido in general and Lake Akan, um, there is a way in which it's somewhat separate from, from at least this story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask kind of about like, sort of if you had heard of any faunal associations or other ecological benefits to Marimo. Um, my background is that I study landscape architecture mm. and yep. when we install things, I mean, I wouldn't suggest we would, you know, take these and install them everywhere, but um, sort of like you did mention the zebra mussel issue. Yeah. And that's usually like, you know, the pros and cons that we weigh. And also I think if there was some sort of faunal association um, you could maybe sidestep the whole like need for a cultural basis and maybe have more like infographics like on site about like what animals would interact with it otherwise, what kind of ecosystem services they may provide. But had, right. had you heard anything along those lines? Not really, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I mean, there are, you know, photosynthetic beings, right, um, as algae. And so there is a degree to which they help condition the lake, right, uh, in kind of an expanded ecosystemic no way. But as far as like s particular benefits, um, it's not something I've really seen discussed all that much. Um, I might have to dig a little bit further into the scientific literature to get there. But certainly when it comes to, you know, conservation efforts, it's much more about culture, right, than it is about, uh, you know, these kind of scientific reasons and justifications. So. Um, yeah, I will let you know if I come across something, though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. I, my question is kind of a broader one, um, and anybody, I open it to anybody in the room, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about environmental humanities as it relates to Japan and Japanese studies. And sure. um, I'm inviting you to take this in whatever direction you want, so it's not supposed to be a hard question. <laughs> um, but I was thinking, you know, there's that little moment in, in sort of in the middle of the talk where you say, oh, there was a debate between electricity <laughs> or marimo. Yeah. And I was thinking about how, um, at least in my ignorance, it seems like so much of Japanese environmental um, policy and protection is very much about energy, mm -hmm. right? Energy importation, energy creation, responding to disasters caused by previous energy creation, right? So I'm th like Fukushima, things like that. So mm. um, I'm sure that that's far too simple. But I was wondering if you could give us some sense of, of how environmental
all humanities relates to Japanese studies, at least as, as you do it or as you would like to do it? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I mean, for, for mm, maybe I'll start with, with myself and then I can kind of think about the types of classes I teach and, and you know, advising of grad students and the like. Um, but for, for my own research, you know, it's coming from a much more sort of conventional literary studies approach, right? Um, I, I had a feeling in graduate school, right, that there was this, this sense that within Japanese literary studies, we were reading scholars in Japanese literary studies and writing for and speaking to scholars of Japanese literary studies, right? And so that kind of insular world, I mean, certainly has its own benefit. Um, but once I started reading about uh, plant life and, and kind of really focusing in on how certain writers were clearly reading and influenced by scientific uh, knowledge about plant life, that sort of made me want to branch out a little bit, right? And, and, and expand the conversation to, um, yeah, a more interdisciplinary approach, right? So, uh, yeah, I think there is definitely, um, this is something I, I, I try to stress to my students, right? Environmental humanities is not always environmentalist humanities, although it certainly can be that, right? Um, but it's it's much more for me about thinking you know beyond the parameters of area studies in general um, to kind of try to reach across the aisle to folks in STEM um, to think about scientific writing as discourse right um, and to think about those overlaps between the ways in which uh, scientists are influenced by literature and literature, you know, literary writers are influenced by scientists. So, I mean, that's kind of my personal investment at the moment is very much focused on, on plant life. Now, plant life is a particularly interesting place to think about this within the context of uh, Japan and Japanese studies because there is this long literary tradition, right, of, of um, saijiki and, right, I mean, classical poetics and all these things that, that are so codified in a certain way, right? And so what happens in, in these moments where all of a sudden you have, um, you know, writers sort of turning away from that and starting to think about evolution, right? Starting to think about biology, botany. Um, so uh, the way in which they kind of end up resisting that literary tradition while also sometimes kind of playing into it uh, is really fascinating to me. So um, there's that, uh, you know, I. From the teaching perspective, from a pedagogical perspective, and I really do think to think about environmental humanities, thinking about it pedagogically is really important. Um, it allows for a real diversity in what you can teach, right? If you, if you want to think in an environmental humanities framework. So you can teach literature, you can teach environmental history, you can teach anthropology, right? Um, and kind of allowing students to sort of move between those texts, right, in these disciplines and seeing the connections between them all, um, I think is, is really useful. And uh, hopefully, yeah, kind of pushing Japanese studies into a much broader conversation, um, you know, without, outside of the confines of traditional area studies. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll maybe take the liberty of like asking the last question unless uh, someone else has a dying question that they want to pose, but, um, that, I mean, that, that's really great, John. Thank you for all, all the things that you said to, to this excellent question. Um, it's sort of raising for me, uh, you know, when you said you, you emphasize a lot to your students that environmental humanities isn't always environmentalist. Environmentalist mm -hmm. humanities is, I, I agree, a very important one. And I suspect, I mean, partly when we critique from the humanities and social sciences what students can bring to the table sometimes about what the presumably they presume to be environmentalism mm -hmm. that we realize that those ideas are actually often very western centric mm -hmm. uh, and very sort of rooted in our own i would argue judeo-christian understandings of of what environmentalism should be um and this sort of raises for me like you know you were mentioning i can't remember the exact context now but um you know kind of uh, just assertions about like the Ainu, like coexistence with nature, yeah. which for me raises this perpetual issue that one confronts when thinking about Japan and the environment, which mm. is this kind of 
persistent myth of an ecologically noble savage that, uh, I mean, is I, I think I knew are particularly constrained by this category. Is yeah. that something that resonates with you? And um, yeah, how do you negotiate that in your teaching, but certainly also in your writing? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's thank you for, for all of that. Um, I, I really couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, in, in including this sort of language, right, that the Akanko Ainu Kotan uses, right? Um, on the one hand, it's like, well, really, who am I to criticize that, right? Or to, to, to question that intent. Um, on the other hand, you're absolutely right, right? That there is this, you know, old sort of myth of, of yeah, noble savage, right? Um, and, you know, this is some of the critique that Golden Kamui has received, for example, right? Of course, Golden Kamui is something that is written by a non-Ainu, right? But, but sort of portraying Ainu culture in this harmonious way with nature, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do feel like it's, it's, on the one hand, important to um, take seriously claims about traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and again, whether or not uh, it is my place to, to challenge the authenticity of that, right? I'm not sure, but it is, I think, uh, it does give a wider context, right, to the establishment of the Marimo Festival and a, a sort of, you know, self, self-inscribed, right, purpose. Um, again, that could be, you know, what we might consider an invented tradition or not, right? And whether or not there is a historical basis for this. But if this is the stated intent of the Marimo Festival, I do think it's important to, to you know, hear those words. And um, so, yeah, in terms of like teaching it, right? I do think it's important to give that perspective while also fleshing out the kind of history, right? That's been imposed upon uh, these notions of, of Ainu relationship to nature at the same time, right? That's great. With that, I think we'll we'll end the event. But uh, another round of applause, please, for Dr. John Pitt and his phenomenal work. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who was here and to everyone who joined us online. Um, more events to come through CJS. So look more looking forward to seeing you all there. <laughs>